Perfect. Do you want to come in quickly, Harriet? Or yeah, I just wanted to say to you that I've made the presentation is far longer than what I'll be able to get through. So all of the information is there anyway. I'll just keep going as much as I can. Perfect. And we can share the PowerPoint after in the follow-up email yeah. as well and any of the resources too. So that's yeah. perfect. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Breakfast Bite webinar series. Uh, today we're talking with Harriet Parsons from Body Why, uh, Bodies Wise in, uh, in Ireland. And in a moment, Harriet is going to talk to us about eating disorders, anxiety, stress, um, and some of the things that we can do as frontline workers during COVID-19 to support people in that particular situation. Before we get started, I want to very quickly do um, a, little, a little overview of a little overview of the Breakfast Pie series. So again, here we are this morning talking about eating disorders with Harriet from Body Wise. Very quick uh, note to say that this isn't our first webinar. This is part of a broader series that we've been doing since COVID-19 um, kicked off towards the end of March. And so on our website, you can find all the previous webinars on the archives. You can watch the maps so if you see something that's of interest. Uh, feel free to go back and watch it on our website for free. The PowerPoints and resources are also on the website so you can get more information if you wish. And as you can see, um, in the month of June, we have some more webinars coming up on self-harm, on um, COVID responses for people who are sleeping rough, and how we build trust with our clients. And we'll also add another webinar between the 10th and 24th of June, which is waiting on some confirmation. Um, and after this webinar, you will receive um, some follow-up information that will have Harriet's PowerPoint, some resources she mentions, but we'll also include these things. So if you see webinars that you want to register in the next few weeks, uh, please do so. And finally, I'd just like to remind people that whether this is your first or your 10th webinar that you're doing with us, Fianza has changed our membership structures in the last year. And so previously, to be a member of Fianza, you have to be a national organization working with people experiencing homelessness. That's no longer the case. You can be regional, you can be local, you might not even be a homeless NGO itself. We now accept cities, agencies think tanks, foundations, etc. And it's part of our broader ambition to end homelessness in Europe. And we can't do that alone. We need a coalition of different stakeholders to tackle the intersectionality of homelessness. So it's very quickly for me, I'm going to hand back over to Harriet, uh, who's um, I'm going to share the screen rights with Harriet so she can get her PowerPoint presentation up. In the meantime, I just want to mention that we have a questions box on the right hand corner or the right hand side of your screen. So if you have any questions about anything that Harriet is mentioning or talking about, or you want some more information, or if there's somebody that you're working with and you're looking for a bit of advice or whatever it might be, feel free to put the questions into the box. And at the end of Harriet's presentation, we can go through those. And with that, Harriet, I'm happy to hand over to you. Okay. Thanks a million, Robbie. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. That's I just saw there you had done um, what I'm motivational interviewing. Yeah. So a lot of the support for people with eating disorders can be based on the ideas in motivational interviewing. Okay. The way um, the way that type of support and that kind of speaking conversations are structured around that is. Um, is one of the key ways to establish a rapport and to support people with eating disorders. So, and that other talk that was there around building resilience as well, that's also, yeah. I'm sure there's lots of points in there around building resilience in people. Um, because if the eating disorder is a coping mechanism, then having the resilience to cope without it is really important. Mm. So just to say that. Okay. Yeah, and we had one on trauma as well that was very similar on the same, um, the same theme so maybe they're good resources for people to check into if they want more yeah i would say the motival inter interviewing one so the maudsley in london which is like one of the centers of excellence where so much has come out of there their um parents support program is based on motivational interviewing ah, it's okay. all motivational interviewing stuff so um yeah so i will show my screen yeah and then you can still see me, but I can only just see my screen. Correct. Okay, I'll do that now. So, full screen Perfect. like that. Is that Perfect. okay? Perfect. Yeah, excellent. 
Okay, will I kick off then? Yeah, so, perfect. Yeah, so uh, my name is Harriet Parsons. I'm a psychotherapist and I work for the Eating Disorders Association of Ireland. Our name is BodyWise. Um, lots of the information I'm going to give you, we've loads of resources on our website, things that you can tap into uh, no matter where you are, um, and lots of downloadable resources, um, which can be really helpful um, for if you find yourself working or coming across people with eating disorders or family and friends of people with an eating disorder um, who themselves need a lot of support. Um, so my role, I'm training and development manager. And um, so a lot of my work would be this kind of work, you know, um, training work with professionals. OK, so what I'm going to do with you this morning is give you, um, I mean, we don't have very long, but I'm going to try and give you a basic understanding of how to think about an eating disorder, which is the understanding that then you can build however you support your per the person. Um, and so it, then it doesn't matter whether you're um, coming across them on a you know, once off or whether you are like a key worker for them or whether you're a social worker or whatever role you play in that person's life. What I'm doing with you this morning can be the foundation for no matter what type of engagement you have with them. OK, so I suppose the first thing to say um, is that the reason why we kind of take eating disorders seriously in that is um, that they have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder and um, so they're really serious um, and you know unfortunately people do die like the female female morbidity rate from anorexia is 30 times the female suicide rate so you know sometimes we think oh they're just about food or you know they're just a bit they're not eating properly or whatever, but actually an eating disorder is a really, really serious psychological illness. And the sooner a person gets help for it, um, the more chance they have of recovering fully from it. Um, so that's why we intervene. That's why we try to support somebody because they really are suffering um, a lot. And I know that um, within homeless services, you often come across people um, who have addictions or, um, you know, are addicted to alcohol or drugs or whatever, there is a huge crossover between eating disorders and addiction. Um, and I would do a lot of training with addiction treatment services. Um, but m my experience of that is often that the addiction is kind of to the substance is on top of the eating disorder. And often what will happen is, is that somebody will get their addiction their substance addiction under control, but what will happen then is that the eating disorder will flare up. Um, so eating disorders are, you know, they're they're kind of they're really private and intimate, and um, and that way people really don't like you to go near them. And um, so it can be hard to help somebody, and um, because they um, probably, you know, don't want to let go of their eating disorder. Um, anyway. OK, so I suppose just to start off with what I mean when I say the word eating disorder, I'm not talking just about anorexia. I'm talking about any eating problem. So anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder or whatever, you know, combination of those eating disorders. And um, they're really complicated to understand because they're not just one thing. They affect every aspect of how a person functions. And that makes it difficult also to treat them because they they cross over different areas um, you know, of medicine as well. So you've got um, you know, the behavioral part. So when a person develops an eating disorder, their behaviors around food become very disordered. And they might starve themselves or restrict food. You know, we have this orthorexia at the moment or clean eating is another form of disordered eating, really. And um, people might binge eat, they, they might vomit, they might make themselves sick, they might over exercise. There's loads of different types of disordered eating behaviors. And the more the person gets into the eating disorder, the more those behaviors become disordered and the more of them the person will have. There's also the cognitive aspect, so that's the person's thinking. So when a person develops an eating disorder, their thinking 
becomes more and more distorted. So they don't think in the same way that a person without an eating disorder thinks. And what that means is that um, when we're talking to them, they're not thinking the same way that we're thinking. Yeah. And the more into the eating disorder they get, the more distorted um, their thinking becomes. So the more illogical it will seem to the outside world, but the more logical it will seem to them. So for example, and, and that distortion feeds into the disordered behavior. So at the beginning, say somebody might think, well, I'm not gonna eat bread because it will make me fat. So they stop eating bread, but after a while, then they think I'm not going to eat any carbohydrates because it's gonna make me fat. So they cut out all carbohydrates. So you can see how the more distorted the thoughts become, the worse, the more disordered the behaviors become. And then all of that impacts on the physical well-being of the person. So physically, when a person isn't eating properly, whether that's under eating or overeating or eating and overexercising or vomiting or whatever it might be, there are physical symptoms, physical effects from that. Um, somebody can become emaciated, somebody can become very overweight, and teeth get eroded enlarged salivary glands you know there's lots of physical symptoms that go with that and they are a consequence of the behaviors but they also then influence the thinking as well so for example they've done studies comparing the brains of people with alzheimer's to people who have anorexia and they're very similar so when a brain is starved it cannot hold complex thought and what that means is that the person's thinking is is more prone to being all or nothing and all or nothing thinking becomes very distorted so it's not just that the physical part is a consequence of the other bit it's that it also is influencing so there's this kind of circuit going on and then in the in the core of the whole thing then you have the emotional aspect that really an eating disorder is about how a person is feeling about themselves so their sense of self so it's all really complicated and because of that it straddles lots of different areas of medicine and also when you're trying to support somebody you're on the outside looking in you can only maybe see the physical part and the behavioral part you can't see how they're thinking or how they're feeling and often when we're on the outside looking in we think god if only they could tell us what's wrong we would know what to do and we would be able to help them to get better but the reality is, is that the per for the person who's in the middle of that eating disorder, they also don't know really why they're doing what they're doing. So they don't, they're not able to tell you. Um, and they might not understand themselves why they can't eat that meal that you've just given them or, you know, why they're, why they're um, purging or, you know, or that. Okay, so what we have to do then, and this is the key part, and if you take away anything from this morning this is the one key part if you're going to help somebody with an eating disorder what you have to think is not that you're going to tell them how to get out of it because they're not going to listen and also you don't know necessarily but what you're going to do is you're going to come up beside them and collaborate with them and support them and you're going to basically say look i don't really understand this and I don't think you really understand it, but together we're gonna to try and figure it out. And in that way, you lower their defenses and they don't feel that you're gonna make them change um, and they feel that you're gonna help them. And if there's anything that you can do, no matter what role you have, if you take that stance with a person with an eating disorder, you will really um, have a much better chance of supporting them. Um, if you take the stance of you should do X, Y, and Z, they're just going to say, no way. They're going to get defensive. Um, the control aspect of the whole thing will just flare up in their heads and they won't be able to listen to you. Now, people absolutely can recover from an eating disorder. So people can and do get better. Full recovery is completely possible. And you know, if you work in addiction services, you can know that there's lots of debate around what does recovery mean. but recovery um to my mind means normalizing all of those four aspects so their behaviors become normal the thinking is normal physically their normal weight and that emotionally they're not using their control of food and their body as a way of making themselves feel better so eating disorders are not primarily about food when you think about them this way yeah what they are 
are coping mechanisms. They are destructive. So that means that they are bad for the person. But there's something about them that the person feels it makes them feel better. It has a function for them. So eating disorders are functional illnesses. And if you're able to understand that the eating disorder is a coping mechanism or that it functions for them, that means in some way it makes the person feel better, feel able to cope in that moment, okay? If you're able to understand that, then you can understand why people with eating disorders are resistant to change or are terrified of letting go of behaviors because what will they do without it? And it's different to an addiction. I think with an addiction, people have positive reinforcement very soon after they start to change their behaviors. You know, physically they feel better and um, their life starts to feel a bit more in control and all of that. But with an eating disorder, that's why I say the motivational in interviewing ideas are really helpful. You have this long period of time where the person has to be motivated to keep going because getting better often feels to the person like they're getting worse. If they feel like a failure for not obeying the eating disorder rules in their head. Okay, this can be really helpful if you're thinking, does this person have an eating disorder? or not yeah if you're just you know you've got alarm bells ringing and you're not sure this can help to orientate your thinking and it can also clarify what we're talking about so how do you know if somebody has an eating disorder or is their eating just really really disordered and that is if you have normal disordered eating at one end of a spectrum and you have eating disorder at the other normal disordered eating we can all understand because we all engage in it we all eat differently every day. How we feel affects how we feed ourselves. And if you think about yourself, you will recognize that. That's perfectly normal. Where you cross over into something that's an eating disorder is where the idea of com compulsion comes in. So when the disordered eating behavior is compulsive, that's when you're talking about something being an eating disorder. And what does that mean? It means that the behavior, so say I'm gonna say example, not eating not eating that meal, that the person feels that they can't eat that meal or else the sky will fall in, their world will fall apart, they'll have an anxiety attack, yeah? The person feels that, like they don't have a choice about it, so something is making them do it, okay? There's no conscious thought involved in the doing it, it's almost automatic, it's like, no, I cannot, or compulsive, you think of making yourself sick after eating, that's a compulsive behavior. And in the moment, it is practically impossible to stop the person from doing it. And that's why when you're supporting someone with an eating disorder, planning is really key. So you don't address stuff in the moment. You plan, you pick your moments when they're calm, um, and you think it through before you start to approach them about stuff. So we're all on the same page. I'm just gonna quickly say, these are the myths about eating disorders. They're not a lifestyle choice. They're not a teenage thing. So anyone can develop an eating disorder at any age. So at the moment, the age is coming down. So we're getting younger and younger people. And um, so the youngest person I've ever spoken to on our helpline service was eight. But the oldest person I've spoken to was a woman in her seventies whose husband had died and her best friend, as a way of getting her out in the evening, had decided to bring her to Slimming World, like a dieting club. And something about that had made this woman's eating go absolutely bananas. And she was now binging and purging and didn't know how to stop and didn't know what was going on. And she hadn't had an eating disorder before. Her eating had been fine. But you can see in that example the convergence of risk factors. So this major event, the bereavement, coincided with this sudden focus on eating in a certain way. And in some kind of pathological way, they became entangled and she developed an eating disorder. It's not a diet and it's not a phase. People don't grow out of it. It's not just women, it's boys and men too. Absolutely, about 25% of anorexia and bulimia is male. And about it's 50 50 for binge eating disorder and it's not forever so you can absolutely recover from an eating disorder when i say the word eating disorder i'm talking about anorexia bulimia binge eating disorder and 
you know, whatever the other specified eating disorders are, okay? Um, I'm just saying that because often people think I'm just talking about anorexia and I'm not. But when you're supporting somebody with an eating disorder, don't get tied up in trying to figure out what exact type of eating disorder the person has, because there is this idea of a trans diagnostic perspective. And that means that all of the eating disorders have far more in common with each other than different. So they differ in terms of the behavioral part and in terms of the weight of the person, but they're really, really similar in terms of all the other psychopathology that goes along with the eating disorder. So the symptoms, the thinking style, the sense of self in the world, the how, how the person experiences and thinks about themselves in the world, all of that is really similar. And I'm gonna talk you through a little bit about that. We have a very short time. So um, as I said to Robbie at the beginning, this presentation, I've left in lots of slides. So when you get it, you can read through and you will, you will get a lot of information. And at the end of the presentation, there's loads of resources there for you to look up. So taking this trans diagnostic perspective then, let's think about how the eating disorders are different, just to, just to clarify our thoughts. Anorexia, what we have is the person restricts their food an awful, you know, a huge amount, has an intense fear of gaining weight and becoming fat. They may exercise excessively. And because of that, they're very low body weight. So they maintain, they make a concerted effort to maintain a significantly low body weight. So anorexia is all about restriction, fear, and low body weight, okay? Whereas bulimia is where the person engages in some binge eating episodes. When they're binge eating, there's usually a sense of lack of control over their behaviors when they're binging. And they also compensate for what they have eaten. So with bulimia, you basically have somebody who eats and then gets rid of the food. Anorexia is all about not eating. And bulimia is all about, well, trying not to eat, but then eating and getting rid of the food, okay? But because the person with bulimia usually eats something, their weight can often be normal. And because their weight is normal, we don't notice it. So it can go on for a long, long time before anybody notices it. And that's why with bulimia, it can be very difficult to spot it. You need to get to know the person, but it can also be really well established before anybody really realizes. And um, so it might take somebody a lot longer to get out of bulimia, although there are no there's no, you know, average time or anything like that. Everybody is different. And that's another thing that's really important when you're supporting someone with an eating disorder. Um, to recognize that everybody with an eating disorder is different. And it's not about becoming an expert at eating disorders. It's about becoming an expert at that person's eating disorder if you're supporting them. So like when I'm talking to somebody with an eating disorder, I will always get them to, to try and tell me, so what does this mean to you? When you say fat, what does that mean to you? When you say binge, what does that mean to you? I will try to get to know what their particular cycle is, what their meanings that they've attached to being thin or being big or, you know, all of exercising and all of those things. Because it's not about the general, it's always about the particular. And when you're supporting someone, if you're able to focus on the particular, um, you'll, 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 you have a much better chance of connecting with that person. Okay. Um, with binge eating disorder, then the person engages in um, recurrent episodes of binge eating and they don't get rid of the food. So there's no compensatory behaviors. And as a result, that person will be more overweight or in the obese category of weight. OK, obesity is not an eating disorder. It is simply a weight classification. The common features then are around this kind of the fear of fat and the desire to be thin, a distorted body image. Um, the, and there's a YouTube video where I talk about all of these things in detail. You can look it up if you Google me on YouTube, you'll find it. Um, there's, the, the person often has really intrusive eating disorder thoughts. 
where they think, where they can't focus on what they're doing because the eating disorder thoughts are so um, preoccupying in their head. Any decision becomes incredibly difficult for the person. They will think, you know, um, if I have this meal that they're offering me now, um, you know, uh, how, uh, how long is it until, um, you know, I've eaten, when, when did I eat before? When am I gonna eat again? How am I gonna exercise? And um, if I have it, how much of it can I have? Well, I had that earlier, so I can only have this much now. Maybe I could allow myself have that much, but it means that tomorrow I'm not gonna let myself have anything to eat. So all of these kind of really um, punishing and really intrusive thoughts really stop the person from being able to relax, to listen. Um, and that's why often people with eating disorders are considered controlling or manipulative. And it's not really that they want to be, it's that every decision takes so much effort for them. Every decision comes down to whether they're a good person or a bad person, that they like to know everything that's happening because they find it too difficult to deal with chaos. And, you know, when people are homeless, there's an awful lot of chaos. So you can absolutely understand why somebody might choose or might find that within controlling their food and their body, they set themselves up with some order and boundaries and rules to follow and a safety net within all of that. You can absolutely understand it. The person will often have really inflexible thinking, so really all or nothing thinking. Um, and when you're supporting someone, it can be really helpful to uh, to to name it, to reflect it back to them, but also that you can be the grey area, that you can help them to see other possibilities, other ways of doing things, other options, because they won't necessarily be able to think about them. With all of the eating disorders, there's always a cycle to the person's behaviours. And if you want to help a person, getting to know what their cycle is, can be incredibly important because it's not about, as I said, intervening on the actual eating disorder behavior. So say somebody purges in the evening time, binges and purges in the evening time. It's not necessarily about intervening in the evening time. It might be about intervening earlier in the day when you know that they go five hours without eating a snack, yeah? And if you are supporting somebody and you're trying to move them towards eating a bit better, the rule of three is your goal. Three meals, three snacks, and not going longer than three hours without eating. Okay, which obviously is an ideal. And if somebody is homeless, then, you know, there's not much, they might not have much choice about that. But even, you know, for you to have that in your head, as that's the kind of eating pattern, that no matter what type of eating disorder the person has, that they will, um, that, that they will um, move towards that. Okay. Um, often people will have very low self-esteem, they will have mood swings, they will be very irritable. And think of it yourself when you're hungry, how you can be irritable. And the, like, think of the word hangry, you know, we're hungry and angry. Um, and, you know, even think about the power of hunger. So if think if anybody here who's listening hasn't had breakfast already, you're going to be start to be hungry. And because you're hungry, you're going to be having thoughts around, you know, I should have eaten before this where I'm going to I'm dying for a coffee. Um, you know, I have to go and get something to eat after because hunger wants us to notice it and hunger wants us to take notice and to to feed it. So if you're trying to avoid your hunger and if you're trying to control your hunger, yeah, it takes more and more effort. The more hungry you are, the more effort it takes. And because it takes so much effort to do that, it distracts you from all the other stuff you have going on. And that's how it is a coping mechanism. Basically, you know, it, it helps the person to, to find something else to worry about, to think about. How am I going to not eat today? How am I going to measure out this food? How am I going to 
exercise enough today, all of those things. The person um, finds it really difficult to cope with change. Um, they will often have um, depression. And sometimes if the eating disorder is kind of working for them, the depression isn't obvious at all. Um, and sometimes as the person begins to let go of their eating disorder, the depression becomes more obvious um, and they will often have OCD type behaviors. OK, so they're all the real common features um, with, with all of the eating disorders. So again, they differ in terms of the behaviors, but they have lots of common features. So when you're supporting someone, I've said it already, it's really important to think that about the language that you use and this idea of getting to know their particular eating disorder. And you can do that through asking them things around, you know, what does fat mean to you? You know, when you say binge, what do you mean? Because technically an objective binge is eating a lot of food in one sitting and feeling out of control while you're eating. But there's a subjective idea of binge as well. And that subjective idea is eating something that I didn't plan to eat and eating in a way that feels out of control. So it feels out of control for that person. Yeah. So um, so if you it, so when you're trying to support somebody, just try not to assume you understand you, you know what the person means. Always ask them. And by asking them what you're doing is you're starting to build a rapport. You're also saying, look, you know, I don't understand this. Let's try and understand this together. So they feel that you're not telling them what they should do. Yeah. Think about it. We all have coping mechanisms. And I would bet money that lots of us have at least one coping mechanism that is not good for us and that we wouldn't really advertise. And if, the per if a person came along to, to you and said, you know that thing you do, you have to stop that. That's really bad. You should stop it. You would get defensive and you would say, who are you to tell me what to do? Leave me alone. And that's exactly the same as it is when you're trying to support somebody with an eating disorder. So you're not trying to come along and say, look, you should do X, Y and Z. You're trying to come along and say, look, I, don't, I can see that you're finding things difficult. I wonder, can I help you? I wonder, is there something that we could talk about? So you're coming at it sideways. And we would always say, when you want to have a conversation with someone, don't focus on the food. So don't focus on what the person is doing, focus on how they're feeling, yeah? And in that way, they are less likely to get defensive and they are more likely to have a conversation with you, okay? Um, I've said that. Um, so in terms of, you know, when you're trying to understand the person who has the eating disorder and how they are experiencing their world, these are the things about their personality that are making it really difficult for them to let go of their eating disorder. They will often be really sensitive to their own feelings, but also really sensitive and really in tune with how people around them are feeling or how they think people around them are feeling. And they often will behave according to how they think other people will experience their behavior, okay? So what that basically means is that their boundaries are really skewed. And it can be helpful when you're supporting someone to be really clear about boundaries. My feelings are my feelings and I can look after them. Your feelings are your feelings and I can help you to figure out how you can look after them, okay? They're often really sensitive to how other people are judging them, and they will often feel in competition with themselves or with this kind of imaginary big other out there. And you'll hear it in the language. And that's why I say focus on the language that they use, because when you start to hear that in their language, like, uh, oh no, um, I couldn't eat that because um, that would be indulgent or um, I've had enough or that's enough for now or something like that. You know, to be able to say to them, well, enough for who? Well, who would think that? And who's saying that? And who's watching and who's judging? So you're trying to highlight for them the way their eating disorder is playing out in their lives and making their lives more difficult. And that's how you build a rapport. 
And that's how you motivate them to try and think about the idea, planting the seed, that they can live in a world without this. Yeah, that they don't need to fear making decisions or fear eating, that they're not going to suddenly put on loads of weight or they're not, everything isn't going to suddenly change if they have a bite of that. Um, okay. A person with an eating disorder often feels that kindness or to accept compassion is a sign that they're weak, they're not strong enough because they need it. So when you are being kind to them, sometimes they can experience that as counterproductive or it has a counterproductive outcome. So you think, well, I'm being really kind to them and I'm trying to help them, but they experience that as I'm a failure. I'm a really crap person who can't do this on my own. So knowing that then, it's important for you to be able to cloak your kindness and your compassion in a way that makes them understand that it doesn't mean failure. But also being kind to themselves is a huge challenge. And they often find it really hard to be nice to themselves. And we would often say to friends or family, role model compassion. So be kind to yourself as a way of showing them that it is okay to be kind to, to yourself. Yeah. So you, to teach them, you have to kind of do it yourself as well. Um, and again, you know, I've got there the black and white thinking that when you spot that, you know, highlight it for them. I would often say to people, even in an email, I would say to people, uh, you know, that sounds a bit old or nothing to me. It sounds like there's only two options in your head. And I wonder, are there others like, and then I might suggest things, yeah? So you're all the time trying to show the person how you're listening to them, how you're trying to understand, how you're not making assumptions and how you're not expecting them to change all of a sudden because that is too scary for them. You have to remember, if, you, if we have this foundation, this one premise that the eating disorder is a coping mechanism, that means that when you have a person that you're supporting who is engaging in disordered eating behaviors, that means it should be an alarm bell in your head that says, they're finding something in their life really difficult, okay? They don't just not eat or suddenly skip loads of meals because they just feel like it. They're doing it because they're stressed, they're upset, they've had an argument, something awful has happened, okay? So the, the way they express their distress is through their disordered eating behaviors. So when you see someone engaging in disordered eating behaviors, if you just focus on the behavior, you're kind of missing the point. And it's much easier for them than just to get angry and there to be a row and them to tell you to just, you know, go stuff it or whatever. But if you see it happening and you think, OK, this means this person is really struggling. And if you're able to say to them, you know, are you OK? Is everything all right? You know, what's been going on? then they're not gonna feel threatened. They're gonna think, you see me, you know, it's just gonna open up a channel for talking, which when you're supporting somebody, even if you only see them once, to help them to see, um, to have that conversation can be so beneficial for them. Because for a moment then, they're able to, um, you know, to let down their defences and actually have a real conversation. Were you coming Harriet, in there? Can I, yeah, I was. Could I give you maybe a five minute warning yeah. to wrap up? Is that possible? Okay. Not to rush okay. you too much because it's really, really interesting. Um, yeah. That's fine. I'm just going to keep going. And as I say, you'll send the slides to people and they can look through and see the other bits. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, yeah. So, if also, if you think that the behaviors, so the eating disorder behaviors are how they're expressing their distress, how can you help with that? You can help with that, I've writ written it there, by getting them to put words on their feelings. Think of the idea, a problem shared is a problem halved, okay? It seems really simple, it seems really cliche for me to say that, 
But the reality is, is that no matter what your role with the person, okay, whether you're their therapist, whether you're their key worker, so whatever your role, if you're able to help the person to articulate, which means put words on how they're feeling, you are helping them um, to reduce the anxiety that they're feeling. Um, you're getting them to slow down their thoughts enough so that they can say them out loud. They will then hear those in a different way. And it just helps to mediate all of the intense um, affect that's associated with those behaviors. OK, so that's really important. Uh, you, this is just to remember that there's always two sides of a person's head when they have an eating disorder. So it's like the eating disorder side and so it's like the eating disorder side and then the real Harry's, OK? the real person. And so one of the really helpful things that you can do when you're working with someone is to externalize the eating disorder, separate the person out from their eating disorder. OK, if you're able to understand the eating disorder as an entity in itself, then it does loads of things. OK, it means you make it an it. So then you two can talk about it together. OK. You can communicate the idea that they're not choosing this, okay? That, um, that it reduces the blame that they feel. So they're able to say, my eating disorder is making me do this. I don't want to be doing this. My eating disorder is making you do, me do this. And then it's the, uh, that collaborative support. So you can team up with the person and help them to fight against the eating disorder. So I'll just tell you really quickly a little story. Um, let me see what the yeah, a little story to um to help to you to visualize this in your head. So there was a mum who was supporting her 13-year-old daughter who had very bad anorexia. Okay. And um mom had taken time off work. She was at home all the time with her daughter. Her daughter um was, you know, was told that she should go into hospital, but mum kept her at home and they had a therapist and a dietitian and a doctor and all of that. And anyway, at a certain point, the therapist said to the mum, OK, what I need you to do is I need you to get up half an hour before your daughter gets up. So that's like at 6.30 a.m. Make her two slices of toast and butter and bring them up to her in bed. And the daughter needed agreed that she would eat the toast before she got up in the morning. So the mom wasn't so happy about having to get up in the morning so early, but she did it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And she said, I had her in talking to our helpline volunteers, and she said that on the Friday morning at about 11 o'clock, she was sitting at the kitchen table and her daughter came downstairs with a plastic bag and tears streaming down her face. And she held out the plastic bag to her mom and she said, Mom, I'm really sorry, but look. And when the mom looked in the plastic bag, there was all the toast from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The daughter hadn't eaten it. And what the mom said was at that moment, she knew everything was going to be OK. Because the daughter had had the wherewithal to stand up to the eating disorder in her head and show her mom that she hadn't had the toast, okay? And so at that moment, the daughter had separated herself out from the eating disorder. And the mum said to her, as long as we're on the same team fighting this eating disorder, we can do it together. But when I'm on my own and you go back to it, I can't do it on my own, okay? So that's the idea I want you to take away. The idea that you can separate out the person from the eating disorder. Try and get the person on side working with you. And the way you do that is by not focusing on what they're doing, but on how they're feeling. Yeah. And and trying this idea of supporting them towards starting to trust enough to let go of the eating disorder. OK, the eating disorder. So if you imagine this coping mechanism, it's like somebody falls into this rushing stream, this river that has rapids and they fall right down and the water is splashing over their head and they're drowning. And suddenly a branch comes alongside them and they grab hold of it and it helps them to get their head above water. 
and they can breathe again and they feel safe again and they're clinging onto this branch you know because it is saving their life but then they realize that at the end of the river there is a massive waterfall and if they fall off the end they're going to die and they realize that the only way they're going to save themselves is by letting go of the branch so they can grab the bank of the river okay um, and that's what it's like for somebody trying to get rid of an eating disorder. They have to feel safe enough, strong enough, and that they can do it to let go of that and grab the bank. And we're like the people who are running alongside them on the bank saying, you can do it. It's all right. We'll be here to catch you. We'll help you. You know, you can do it. We're those people. So we have to, um, we have to keep, we have to keep motivated for them. We have to not give up on them. Um, and we have to, you know, treat them as a unique person with a unique eating disorder. And um, that will go a long way to helping you in your work. So now in the slides, um, I have a lot more information there. Okay, examples of how to reinterpret eating disorder behavior. And at the end, I have a list of resources as well. And I'll send Robbie on another one I just thought of that I hadn't um, put in. Okay. Okay, Robbie. So, well, I think I might stop there. Perfect. Thanks so much, Harriet. That was honestly, I think one of the best webinars I've had in a long time. It was really, really informative uh, on a topic that I personally know. I turn my screen back on. Uh, on a topic that I personally don't know a lot about, so I found it really informative oh, yeah. as give it, building that like baseline information and really yeah. practical as well on tips that we can take. So for anyone who's got questions, please feel free to put them into the questions box. Yes. Um, to kick things off, i just like to, because you mentioned, particularly in the beginning, the you were likening or the parallels between addiction and an eating yes. disorder. And yeah. a huge part of um, recovery models for addiction is around harm reduction. Yeah. And so is harm reduction something that you'd work with in eating disorders? Uh, and if so, how does that manifest itself? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it is essentially, but we, we, we wouldn't call it harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it also depends on the age of the person with the eating disorder. Um, so yeah, I suppose like what, what you're always working towards is, t is taking baby steps. So you're so once you're kind of moving forward, you have to be as as somebody supporting somebody, you have to be okay with that. So what you would be trying to do would be yes to reduce to in some way try to reduce the amount of eating disorder behaviours the person is engaging in, trying to help give the person the tools to cope if they find themselves in a really bad spot with it. Um. And I suppose that idea of resilience to just keep going, you know, that lapsing and relapsing is completely part of it. And um, mm -hmm. it's always going to happen, but you have to turn it around and see it as a positive. So with each, with people with eating disorders, it's all about focusing on trying to make things. This is a good thing. This is positive. We can learn from this. And when you're trying to get them to, to take a step or to do something, to treat it as an experiment because mm -hmm. experiments are supposed to fail. Yeah, because they're so sensitive to the idea of not doing it well enough. So say, mm -hmm. you know, so say you were, so I'm imagining, say you're a support worker or something, yeah? And you have this conversation with somebody one night where they open up to you and you're talking to them and you say, well, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? And say that person then goes off and is not able to do that they are going to avoid you from then on because they're going to feel like they've let you down so to my mind harm reduction is about being able to say well you could try this but it's really hard and it's all right if you don't do it and mm -hmm. you know i suppose the goal would be that to try and have your rule of three but like maybe you know see what it might be like to experiment with doing um with having one snack or trying to spread your food out so not change your food but spread it out over the day so you're all so you're all the time i think trying to reduce mm -hmm. the harm for them yeah. and they really are like addictions like eating disorder they have their preoccupation like an addiction 
the progression mm -hmm. and the negative consequences, but they differ in terms of recovery. So the I, you know, with addiction, we think once an addict, always an addict. Like once an alcoholic, you're always going to be an alcoholic. Like you can never drink again. But with but with eating disorders, it is the idea of full recovery. Yeah. yeah. Now there is OA, which is for people with eating disorders that's based on the AA model. And that mm -hmm. works for some people. But for a lot of people with eating disorders, it doesn't work because it's based on abstinence. Yeah. And the idea of avoiding kind of trigger foods and things like that. And I suppose to my mind, I would kind of feel like, you know, if you can never have a slice of cake again, that's not normal. Like you should be able to have. Yeah, you're still in it almost. Yeah. It's about normal eating. And as yeah. I say, we all eat in a disordered way. So it's about it being normal. Yeah. Yeah. So we've um, a few comments from some of the participants. Uh, so one person wrote in that uh, I had an eating disorder in the past and now I live in recovery. I'm healthy and my weight is good. However, my image is so distorted. I'm naturally petite, very small framed, but I don't see that. I just avoid mirrors because it drains me. Meanwhile, I don't see it as a problem if someone is carrying some extra weight. In my eyes, they are still beautiful. It's just the way I feel about me. Yeah. And it, that's the kind of the crux of the, the you know, the idea of um, a person, you know, thinking, well, it's totally fine for everyone else, but I have a different set of rules for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I suppose so part of um, of getting out of that is is thinking about that and thinking about, well, why would you have different rules for yourself? And 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 what is it that's difficult about looking at yourself in the mirror? And they're all really huge questions that take a long time to work out. And sometimes you need to work them out with a therapist and work work out those things. But, you know, it would be a terrible shame to think that someone came through a whole eating disorder um, and stopped at that point because, you know, it's all right to look in the mirror and it's all right to like yourself. And and everybody has days where they don't like themselves, yeah. you know. Um, but I suppose, you see, it's the, again, with with you think of the continuum bit it's the bit of i cannot look at myself in the mirror so there's something about that about the the what's the word the that it's so adamant i can't do that to myself yeah. you know that that's that's a question i would think that a person could have for themselves and think about you know well why is that the way it is for me um, more comments, people just saying it's a really interesting webinar, really informative, thank you very much. Uh, also very encouraging to know that eating disorders can be overcome. I think that's something really important um, that you made really clear in the presentation. So another question comes in, uh, thank you, I agree with Robbie, one of the best webinars I've attended. I've been looking for some guidance on this issue for a while. I've come across quite a, quite a few young men who have effectively been starving themselves and expressed anxiety around eating food was using food poverty as a reason, despite knowing they have support available to access food. I've been struggling to assess whether their feelings and behavior is self-harm or an eating disorder. Two in particular have expressed a lot of self-consciousness about their small frames. What are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I suppose it's a whole debate around self-harm and eating disorders. And lots of times people would say that an eating disorder is a form of self-harm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, an eating disorder is harming yourself. There's no getting around that it is. What I would say to that person is maybe let go of the idea of trying to figure out which one is it and just try to deal with what's happening, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, there's, there's, there's a young man who's um, restricting his food and um, in a situation where he does have access to it and 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 that's there's a question around that what is going on with that and if you think about the idea of control and chaos and all of that um putting restrictions around food is a way of putting in place safe boundaries and a sense of um routine and control and that and and i think you know, the way to start with that is to have a conversation about, you know, you know, the way you could eat these meals and you don't. 
I wonder what's going on or sometimes is it easier for you to have to think about doing it or not? Do you want to try and open up the conversation and have a conversation about it that's not just about why aren't you eating the food, mm -hmm. but that's about your thoughts and feelings around the not eating it or the situations that make it harder for you to think about it or there's so many different ways you could approach yeah. that but again to try not to focus on what they're doing but to focus on how they're feeling um, yeah it's back to that thing you mentioned earlier so the importance of just having conversations and partnering and not coming in and uh, some sort of like top down dictating or mandating behaviors exactly yeah 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 yeah. But that's it for the questions. I, uh, it was a very clear presentation. So usually sometimes people come away with more questions than they had going into it. Okay. Uh, but not here. It was really, really clear, really informative. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much, Harriet, for coming on and Thanks, doing this. Thanks for uh, asking uh, really, me. Yeah. Not all, really interesting topic. And we'll be sending around the PowerPoint, the recording, and any resources Harriet has mentioned tomorrow. So keep an eye on your inbox for those. Okay, Great. thanks very much, everybody, okay, and have a lovely day. Okay, Bye. you too. Bye.